Welcome to today's program titled Pay Transparency in 2023. At this time, all participants are in a listen only mode. For those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the Q&A box on the right hand side of your screen. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on the CLE attendance affirmation form. Please write this code down as it will not be reread and is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials, along with the CLE attendance form, will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. On the next slide, you will see a legal disclaimer. This presentation has been prepared by Seifarth Shaw LLP for informational purposes only. The material discussed during this webinar should not be construed as legal advice or a legal opinion on any specific facts or circumstances. The content is intended for general information purposes only, and you are urged to consult a lawyer concerning your own situation and any specific legal questions you may have. At this time, I would like to turn it over to our first speaker for today's program, Annette Tymon. Annette, please go ahead. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have a very uh, packed agenda um, as we talk about pay transparency issues. Uh, I am joined today, I'm here in the Chicago office and I'm joined with colleagues in our New York and uh, California offices. We are a team that has been studying these uh, various uh, pay equity issues, in particular pay transparency and uh, uh, reporting. Uh, that is coming up. So we wanted to share our insights as we know that employers are very uh, focused on this. On the next slide, we're going to show you or give you a highlight of the agenda and where we're headed today. So you have a, a basic lay of the land for the next hour or so. Uh, we're going to start uh, talking about pay transparency and the big picture, right? Where do we see uh, the states uh, in particular focus on the states overall um, in this uh, quest to ensure that we've got uh, pay equity throughout um, our, our workplaces uh, on the basis of, of primarily uh, um, uh, gender and race, although there are other categories that are that are uh, covered. Um, but in uh, that vein, pay transparency is a key issue. So we're going to talk about the various laws that are coming up in the wage range disclosures um, and what uh, employers are being required to do. We're going to tackle the top six questions. We tried to come up with a nice round number, but it didn't quite fit in. So we're going to give you the top six questions. We're going to talk about some best practices as we see them. And then we put together, uh, we sent out uh, uh, solicited questions from attendees and we already have received uh, some questions. We're gonna do our best to answer all of those as well as take questions and, and try to respond throughout the webinar as, as we can. Um, and then we're gonna close it out, touching on the pay data reporting requirements that are coming up. We're gonna do our best to tackle this as much as possible. I will tell you as we prepared for this, however, um, I feel like we we packed a lot more in than we're probably gonna be able to cover. So some of the slides are you'll see are in here uh, for informational purposes. We're not gonna go in every detail because we've actually done a, a lot of pay uh, transparency um, and pay equity webinars. So we'll refer you to those generally. But if we go to the next slide, let's just start with the big picture, right? The trend towards pay transparency continues. Um, we have a map that we've put up. Um, the pending jurisdictions that you'll see are in orange and the purple uh, uh, jurisdictions are in uh, purple. I say jurisdictions because we've got some local uh, city uh, uh, Tra pay transparency requirements. For example, if you're in New York City, you know that you, that uh, requirement was uh, uh, just in play starting November 1st. Um, but you know there is this trend to continue on. There's about uh, 16 jurisdictions that have some sort or recently introduced a a, a, um, a, a, a pay transparency bill. Um, there was also one pending in in uh, on, on 
in uh, the federal government in the House. Um, that is likely not going anywhere, so we remove that from our summary, but that just gives you a sense of where things are headed. And that's really what we want to focus on going forward. California and Illinois are the two states that have adopted pay reporting requirements. California has had it in place for a couple of years, but we're seeing um, much more uh, kind of deeper uh, information uh, going forward. So with that, let's go to the next um, slide. And we're going to talk about at a high level, the impacted jurisdictions. And this is where um, we want to give you this information and we've prepared um, uh, the, the slides that are coming up in just a moment, but we've also covered these quite extensively. And so the focus of today is really around kind of going beyond what's in the, um, the specific uh, requirements. So California, um, uh, Washington State, New York City, uh, those seem to be the, the big ones. Obviously, Colorado, by now you've probably been working in Colorado for over a year now, but many other states have pay transparency requirements. And if we go to the next slide, we start seeing that, you know, as we think about them, they're bucketed in sort of three different ways. The first way is the affirmative disclosure, right on the job posting. There is a requirement to include information about the pay ranges. And we see that in California, in Colorado, in Washington State, excuse me, in Washington, um, in Washington State, as well as um, New York City jurisdictions, as well as county, uh, Albany County, Ithaca, um, and Westchester County in New York. The, the pending, um, uh, just so that you know, it's kind of hot off the presses in New York, there's a state bill that we've been waiting uh, for that to move forward. And that um, uh, bill is actually just, I believe yesterday, uh, did go to Governor Hochul for um, signature, whether she, she would have to veto it for it not to be passed. And we do anticipate that she's going to uh, sign it or by operation of law in um, uh, New York, just the way the requirements work, uh, it will be passed if she doesn't veto it. So that is uh, coming up soon. And that requires employers to really think very affirmatively right on their job postings to put um, information about the pay ranges on there. If we go to the next group of slides, this is the one that's going to start with number two. It's actually our slide number 10. Um, Yes, so here is also an affirmative disclosure requirement, but here there's a little bit more nuance, right? It, it's not necessarily that the pay range is required right on the uh, job posting, but it is required at some point in that, um, in the process uh, before, you know, e even if an employee doesn't ask for it. So for example, in Nevada, upon completion of an interview for a position, the employer has to affirmatively provide the pay range for that particular um, position. Um, so that just gives you a sense of that additional bucket. And then the third bucket is the, you know, the jurisdictions that are only requiring it upon request. So um, that's where an employee just, or, or an applicant would just request uh, information as well as Maryland. I should have added both Ohio jurisdictions in Ohio as well as Maryland. So at a high level, we have spent, um, I think we've done several webinars that cover these uh, states and kind of what the requirements are. So the information is going to be in the deck that everybody gets, but we're going to really pivot now to try and address the top questions that we continue to get from employers um, as they try to navigate um, the various laws and where they operate. So with that, we're going to turn it over uh, to Christy, who's going to start with the first uh, question that we continue to get. What is a job posting or an advertisement? Great. Thanks, Annette. Yeah, so as Annette said, we know that there are eight jurisdictions that currently require the um, paid disclosure and job descriptions. And again, the pressing kind of question is, what's a job description? What is an advertisement? Um, and of course, each jurisdiction kind of has their own view. Some jurisdictions haven't even defined job posting or advertisement yet. So it can get a little bit tricky. Um, but most of us, when we hear job advertisement or posting, we immediately start to think about a posting on your career site, right? A formal kind of job posting. So that's almost always going to be covered by these requirements. Um, but what about something like an email, right? It's not really what we think of as a job posting, 
Um, but if it contains the appropriate information, it could potentially be considered a job posting or advertisement in certain ju certain jurisdictions. Um, so for example, in, and if we can just move on to the next slide, please. Um, it, as an example, in Washington, if an email or, you know, the posting is intended to recruit job applicants for a specific available position, and it includes qualifications for that position, that email or whatever that document is could be considered a covered posting. We get questions a lot about what about help wanted posters, right? So some jurisdictions like Colorado and Westchester County have specifically said in their laws that they, the law does not apply to help wanted signs that don't reference a particular position. Um, there are other jurisdictions like California who again have not yet, yet fully defined job posting um, but potentially there, a help wanted sign could be covered. Um, in New York City, uh, we originally had an exemption for general notices without any reference to a particular position, but that exemption was removed from the amendment. And so now New York City defines an advertisement as a written description of an available job promotion or transfer opportunity that's publicized to a pool of potential applicants. So it seems that a general help wanted sign, you know, without a written description of an available job wouldn't be covered in New York City, but it's still unclear since that kind of explicit exemption no longer exists. Um, another kind of related question that we get really often is what about internal job postings? Um, do the pay range disclosure requirements apply to internal postings? Um, in most of the jurisdictions that require the pay range disclosure in job postings, um, like New Jersey, New York City, Westchester, Albany County, Ithaca, New York State, potentially, if, if it's enacted, um, the laws require pay range information to be included in the job posting or job advertisements um, for a job, a promotion, or a transfer opportunity. So in those states that specify for a promotion or a transfer opportunity, that would include or cover internal job postings. Um, Colorado also requires notices of promotional opportunities and those notices must include the pay range information. So those internal types of postings are covered as well. Um, but the answer isn't as clear in California. Um, the California law specifically states that the pay information um, has to be included in any job posting but again, there in California, we don't have a definition of job posting. Um, Washington is similar. It requires pay range disclosures in each posting for each job opening. Um, and then they define a posting as a solicitation intended to recruit job applicants for a specific available position. And then they further define applicant to include existing employees. So it's likely that internal posti um, postings would be covered in Washington as well. Um, but we kind of debate this one internally a little bit because the Washington law also requires employers to provide salary range to employees upon request after an offer of internal transfer or promotion. Um, so it seems a little bit dupl duplicative to provide it in an internal posting. And then again, if the employee requests it upon offer, um, but we think that the law may have been written this way to cover the scenario where there are no internal postings. Um, so remember, it's kind of a point that I wanted to highlight here is these laws that we're talking about require certain information to be post, um, included in the job postings if they exist. So none of the laws, with the exception of the promotional notices in, in Colorado, actually require employers to use job postings. Um, so again, it's not so clear in California and Washington as it is in the other jurisdictions, but we think that it's likely that internal postings are covered. Um, next slide, please. Remote positions are favorite. Um, so here, you know, everyone wants to know, do these requirements apply to the remote, um, remote positions? Um, again, each jur jurisdiction is a little bit different, um, but it's pretty clear that the pay scale information must be included in postings for remote positions that could, can, or will be performed, at least in part, um, in Colorado, New York City, Washington, and then New York State, if it's at past. Um, Westchester is a little bit less far reaching in the requirements in that they would only apply to postings for remote positions that are required to be performed in Westchester County. 
So if you have a remote position that could be performed in Westchester County, it's not necessarily covered if it's not required to be um, performed in Westchester County. Uh, the other jurisdictions, Albany, California, Ithaca, Jersey City, they don't directly address remote positions in their guidance, but we think that they'll likely follow that same trend and cover remote um, employees as well. Um, now, another question we get from employers sometimes is, um, you know, we want, they want to be cute and say, can we just put in our job postings, um, we're not accepting applicants from any of these jurisdictions that require the information and postings. Um, be careful with that one because some of these uh, jurisdictions have come out, um, like what Colorado and Washington and have spe bleh, specifically said that you cannot do that. Um, so be careful there. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Maria if you want to talk a little bit more about what's actually in the postings. Yeah, thanks, Christy. Um, if we could go to the next slide. So a question we get often is, how do I define the salary range? So we have our job posting. What range do I actually put in there? And a few kind of general rules to go by is that the salary range is typically just a base salary or a base wage range. Um, it doesn't include other forms of compensation like discretionary bonuses, and it doesn't include um, any kind of other benefits in this range. Um, Another clear point that we get from a lot of the guidance in these jurisdictions is that the range cannot be left open-ended. So typically you can't say something like um, 50,000 and up or max 100,000. Something like that is not acceptable, at least under the New York City guidance and the Colorado guidance. And we would expect that the other jurisdictions would take a similar approach. Um, and in general, what these jurisdictions are focusing on is what you reasonably or in good faith expect to pay for the position. So that really looks at take, it looks at your roles and what you expect that you are going to pay for this role at the time you are posting the position. And going to Christy's point about uh, remote jobs and, and looking at remote positions, we get this question a lot about how do I define the salary range for these remote roles? They, if they can be performed anywhere. Um, my range in New York City may be a lot different than what I'm going to pay somebody in Texas. What do I do in those circumstances? Um, and we think that for remote roles that truly can be performed anywhere, what you in good faith expect to pay for the position is that broad range. And it really depends on the candidate that you're going to be getting um, in terms of what you're ultimately going to be paying that person. Now, you may want to specify in your posting that uh, geography influences where you're going to be falling on the range um, and other kind of factors that might influence someone's position on the range. But in terms of defining the salary range, um, it really is based on what what you expect you're going to be paying for the position. Um, a note on Washington, because Washington now, the administrative policy for Washington just came out, um, I think it was about a week or two ago, and it defines uh, things a bit differently, which has raised some questions um, for some people in terms of whether this changes how we define salary range. So you'll see here, this is kind of how the different laws uh, define a salary range. And um, Washington looks at the most reasonable and genuinely expected range of compensation for the job, which is fairly similar to what we see in the other locations. Um, and then it talks about uh, if no existing wage scale or salary range, uh, if you don't have one in place already, then you should create one prior to the posting that's in the guidance. And if we could go to the next slide. Um, I quickly wanted to mention this nuance in the Washington law. So the first paragraph here is what I just described about the general, uh, how to define the pay scale. And then in the second part, it goes into uh, this nuance for if you're implementing a starting range or starting rate for an initial period of employment or a probationary period. So there has been a bit of discussion about what this means. If you are 
planning to pay someone a starting range um, that's lower than what they would be going into the role afterwards? Does this impact how you define the overall range? Do you have to provide a starting range and an overall range for the for the role as a whole? Um, and we've been reading this narrowly so that this implementing a starting range or rate requirement is really just when you are having an initial time frame of or an initial probationary period where you're paying someone a lower amount and then you plan to bump that person up to the higher amount after that probationary period uh, is finished and we've run kind of our narrow interpretation by the washington agency and we've um, they have agreed with that type of narrow interpretation um, but we wanted to mention this nuance because because it seems to be raising a lot of questions from our clients. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. And in addition to the uh, salary range, there are a couple jurisdictions that also require you to describe other compensation and benefits, and that's Colorado and Washington. Um, so in those jurisdictions, you are required to provide a general description of all benefits for the position. Um, and here are listed a few examples of the types of position uh, benefits that would have to be described. Um, it's pretty much all uh, tax reportable benefits, but not minor perks. Um, again, no open-ended phrases like et cetera or more. You need to be specific in what the benefits are that are provided for that role. Um, and just to be clear, so it's a general description of those benefits. However, all of the benefits for that particular role must be listed in the posting. Um, Washington may also require a bit more detail than Colorado. In the administrative policy, it goes into um, specifying if you are providing more time off or vacation or holidays. Um, and the guidance says that an employer should list the amount of days or hours the hired applicant would expect to receive. So that's additional vacation time, additional time off, additional holidays. Um, the guidance suggests that you are to put that additional information in the posting as well and not just say something like vacation days, uh, holidays um, in those general terms. Um, and also the guidance in Washington specifies that if your description, if your benefits change after the posting has already been published, then an employer should update the posting to reflect any updated benefits information. Okay, moving on to the next question. Um, I believe, Annette, you're taking that one. <laughs> okay, so one of the questions that we've been receiving is, what happens if our company doesn't have pre-established pay ranges? How do employers who really don't have a real uh, well-defined comp structure um, address these issues? And I really think it's twofold. Um, you should certainly be working with your legal counsel and your comp teams on this, but I sort of view this as kind of a short term and then a longer term approach. You know, in a few weeks, um, if you have employees or you're posting jobs in those critical states or jurisdictions, California, Washington in particular, which are joining Colorado and New York City, you're going to need to do something, right? So first, I would say start with prioritizing the jobs that are likely to be posted. I mean, it feels overwhelming when you think about all the potential jobs jobs, but I would prioritize. Which jobs do you know that you are constantly posting for or they're key to your um, business? And so start with prioritizing those, perhaps pull a list of where you think you might be for Q1, Q, uh, Q2. And then for those, focus on some of the existing data that you might have to formulate ranges, right? Remember that uh, the states are requiring you to provide information about what you reasonably or in good faith believe that you would um, provide um, to someone starting a, a, a new hire to your organization. So think about things like what is the, the current employee pay? Um, for those roles. Obviously, you're going to have to think about, you know, where those workers are in the continuum. For example, if you have highly experienced uh, workers uh, within uh, your jobs, you're going to have to take that into consideration, but it's certainly a key data point that you could be using. Um, you can also add um, 
uh, think about your starting salary for your recent hires. So who have you hired into those key roles in the last you know, one or two years? Certainly the market has changed considerably, so you need to keep that in mind, but, but those, that's another data point, a really good data point that you can use. Um, and then anything that might be readily available from a market data perspective. Uh, this is not perfect, but this is sort of what you might do, kind of a crash course on coming up with some guidelines and then vet that against um, you know, what you reasonably might think you, you may pay. So for example, another uh, component, I don't like relying on this uh, solely, but it's as another data point is look at the pay of the incumbent, the reason why the jobs are open. Um, that's another data point. So, so think through within your organization, what are the available data sources that you have to come up with um, what you think you might pay. This is something that you probably already are doing because you're having conversations, you're thinking about the budget, where you're at and what you might reasonably pay. And so thinking about what that range would be is something that, you know, it's quite manual if you don't already have a pre-established pay range. Um, but that's unfortunately with the efforts uh, that you're gonna need to undertake in order to come into compliance. Um, we're going to talk about some of the enforcement provisions and what we might see uh, going forward in, in uh, a, a slide coming up. Um, but that is something that, uh, you know, to, to think about because um, you're also going to be assessing your overall risk in that. Longer term, however, um, it's certainly not required. So I don't want to um, leave you all with the uh, impression that that you must have a defined uh, comp structure, a defined uh, salary ranges for your uh, particular positions, um, but it certainly would be a good practice to have, especially in this world where you are going to need to provide uh, greater transparency um, as you saw the jurisdictions that might have this uh, requirement coming forward. The other thing I would, I would add is, um, you know, having um, pay ranges is um, important and it's helpful for ensuring equal pay principles or pay equity principles, but it's it's a bit different, right? It helps support it because you sort of understand where within a range the organization values a particular job. So it's very job focused and you're sort of um, identifying what the specific skills or the specific requirements that you're looking for. And then what an individual makes within that range is a little bit different, but that does serve as a good framework to help um, in the um, in the uh, pay equity uh, world, but it's not it's a it's a bit different, right? So here, I think you you really want to be partnering with comp professionals. They're going to certainly be your internal professionals, but also um, they're really great um, uh, external consultants who really are compensation professionals that have really sound um, market data that you can use, different sources of information that you can uh, use as well. Um, if you don't have anything in place, you're going to be developing or refining your existing structure. And by that, I'm talking about the job level that you might uh, have or implement within your organization, thinking about the different functions within the organization. You're going to want to uh, perhaps refine the experience level. So what does it mean to be a management level one uh, individual? Um, and you'll obviously you're going to uh, set up your own uh, structure, but those are the kinds of considerations or thinking about the jobs and the roles that you have within the organization to, to begin putting some structure around them. Thinking about the various uh, scope of responsibility, how you might identify career tracks. So if you're in the tech industry, you might want to have a specific focus on tech in particular, a tech um, track versus all others um, because the uh, management levels or the way you structure the organization might in fact be different. Um, you're going to want to introduce market data at some point, right? Have an understanding of where you are as an organization. Are you going to be, you know, leading the market? Are you going to be just tracking along? Are you going to be lagging the market? Those are all considerations that you're going to want to make um, as you set up your ranges. Um, and your competitiveness within, within, you know, as you compare uh, against benchmark, but at the end of the day, the pay equity issue is really what you're paying internally at the organization. 
along with all of that information, thinking about where you're paying. How are you going to consider geographic pay differentials? Um, how are you going to apply remote work? Um, if someone is working remotely um, from a particular jurisdiction, are you going to pay based on uh, what you have traditionally done, or do you need to rethink that? Uh, some employers are moving to wherever the employee resides. That's the differential that they're getting, and so if that's the case, you're going to want to incorporate that information into your uh, salary uh, structure. Um, and then you're going to obviously uh, develop those pay ranges with all that information that you're you're working with. And this is a pretty detailed, deep, um, extensive look at your organization. It's not something that you can, I don't think anyway, in my experience working with other uh, employers who are doing this, it's a pretty involved process, lots of thinking around the jobs, the roles, and, and the compensation strategy overall. Before you finalize anything, this is a very strong um, uh, recommendation is to make sure that before you roll it out, you really look within your organization where your current sit, your current workforce sits with regard to pay within that framework. So once you start changing jobs and, and implementing structures and implementing leveling, thinking about how the pay of your existing workforce uh, fits within that is really important. So look at, that's when you start looking at and evaluating uh, race and gender and how it sits in your comp structure before you finalize and roll it out. You might find that you have to uh, implement significant pay adjustments to bring people up to market. If you haven't been doing that, you could have compression issues. And in the world where you are moving into a world uh, where you've got pay transparency, if you don't do that work or at least include it as part of your long-term strategy, uh, you, I think you'll be at a disadvantage. Um, so that's just another key consideration uh, to think through as you move forward. Okay, so let's uh, turn to the next slide. And I think I'm going to turn it over to now to uh, Sharday. Thanks, Annette. So a lot of you are probably wondering kind of what is it going to cost you if you are out of compliance with any of the various pay transparency laws that are in effect. We've just highlighted here some of the key states that have these job posting requirements and what the penalties are. As you can see, the penalties can get significant very quickly. In California, we have a range anywhere from $100 per violation all the way up to $10,000. And then we see similar broad ranges in a lot of the other jurisdictions. Colorado also goes up to $10,000. New York City can go up to $250,000. And then Washington, we have actual damages or $5,000, whichever is greater. And then penalties that can go up to $1,000 per violation. So when you consider uh, each job posting as potentially being one violation, these penalties can get pretty significant. Some of the jurisdictions do have an opportunity to cure a violation. For example, California, you can avoid the fine for the first initial violation if you can show that all of your job postings have been updated. And similarly with New York City, you can cure your violations as well by showing that the postings are updated. But in New York City, they have that additional provision that that any proof of cure is automatically deemed an admission of liability. So we don't have that same language for California, but we do have that specific language for New York City. All of the various pay transparency job posting requirement laws can be enforced by the applicable state agency. And some of the laws also include a private right of action. So in California, it's possible that we could see some PAGA penalties. We haven't seen that tested yet, but possible we could see PAGA penalties for failing to disclose the wage ranges as required. Colorado, we don't have a private right of action, but employees are able to make a complaint with the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment if there are any alleged violations. In New York City, we have a private right of action only for employees. So note that there's no private right of action for any applicants. There's only a private right of action for employees. And again, you have that enforcement mechanism through the Commission on Human Rights as well. And then in Washington, there is a private right of action that can provide for civil actions for damages and then also uh, penalties imposed by the Department of Labor and Industry. It is possible as well that some of these jurisdictions would conduct some sort of audit. For example, in California, 
there is that record retention requirement. And as part of that requirement, the statute gives the labor commissioner authority to go in and inspect any records that are maintained to determine whether there has been a wage violation. And those records are maintained for a period of three years. So it's definitely contemplated that some of these agencies are anticipating that they're going to need to engage in these enforcement actions and inspect whatever records exist. So it's very important to make sure that you're engaging in proper rec record keeping practices when you are both determining your pay scales and also making the postings um, for any of the jobs that require uh, pay scales to be disclosed. Now we are going to turn to some of the best practices for these pay scale disclosures. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and jump in and start uh, chatting about the um, best practices. If we go to the next slide, we'll see what we've you know identified here. I mean, there are we could probably spend a whole hour talking about best practices, and and you know thinking about where you are. This is very um, company specific. Um, because part of this is where you're at with your journey, right? Where are you with regard to pay transparency? If, for example, you do, you're uh, one of those employers that doesn't have a um, uh, pay range is already established with, for your organization, you're going to be in a much different position. Also, it matters where you're at, where the majority of your workers are coming, um, the nature of remote work. And so all of those issues are really uh, important as you think about how to navigate the pay transparency requirements going forward. You are certainly going to want to start with your key stakeholders at your organization to develop that comprehensive strategy. That includes certainly your recruiters, uh, senior leaders within your organizations, comp, benefits, even your IT uh, folks, uh, you know, literally how you're going to provide the information somehow in your applicant tracking uh, systems or HR, HRIS systems in operation. So having a, 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 a group, a working group on this is going to be certainly uh, important. Um, consider where, whether or not you might implement a uh, organization-wide approach versus a state-by-state -state approach. We are certainly getting more and more questions um, about this and how employers might do this. If you have a lot of workers, um, you know, in every state and jurisdiction, um, it, it might uh, be a practice that you want to take on if in fact as an organization everything is done really centrally and it's difficult to do to handle things on a local level um, so those are consideration thinking about your guiding principles who's going to provide the information how is it going to be provided in what forum are there current um, templates documents that need to be revised in order to incorporate some of the the pay ranges remember we're focusing right now on postings um, because that's going to be the most visible sort of to the external world but these pay transparency requirements also apply with regard to your own um, uh, some of your internal uh, uh, dynamics so sometimes for example it also applies in promotion so think about your promotional processes and how um, these requirements will impact you you also are going to want to think about um, uh, whether you want to provide greater transparency generally about how compensation is set. That is one of the questions that continues to come up for employers. How do I deal with my current employee workforce um, that may not understand uh, once they see what a posted pay range is? Um, how do I explain to my existing workforce how we are uh, addressing pay? And so considering whether you want to be more transparent for your, uh, especially your, your internal population, just about how pay is set at the organization might um, help answer or assuage questions that might be coming up. There's certainly no requirement to do so, but certainly think about whether that's something you would want to do as an organization. Um, certainly determining the wages for each jurisdiction is critical. Um, you, you really should spend some time thinking about employees that are, might be above or below that existing range. Uh, certainly below the range. If you're posting a job and you're saying, you know, you've got folks uh, that are coming on board and you already have through compression or for whatever reason acquisition, sometimes this happens, you have some workers that are below the existing pay range, you're going to want to think about how you're going to deal with that um, particular uh, issue. Um, you're going to want to talk about um, whether you're going to, how you're going to post or talk about your geographic differentials, especially for uh, those remote workers and how you're going to deal with that. 
um, full range versus posted range. Um, you know, there are many employers, especially several years ago, there was a big push to um, provide broad, uh, to, for companies to, uh, to implement broad-based um, pay ranges. And now the requirements are to, you know, what's the reasonable expectation for a particular uh, a post, for, excuse me, for a particular job, what the pay range is for that particular job. So you're going to want to balance that and understand what data do you have as you consider what you actually uh, post. You really want to balance the legal requirements and the optics. And so if you were watching the news at all or tracking at all what happened in New York City, day one, there were reports uh, right off the bat about uh, specific companies and the broad ranges that they were posting and how you know many felt that that wasn't uh, sufficient that companies were hiding the ball and not wanting to share information i won't go into some of the specifics but there was a lot of news reports and media reports out there so it might have met the legal requirement but from an optics perspective from an employee base perspective those are all considerations for you as you uh, move through and, and think through how you want to implement uh, the requirements. Certainly, you're going to need to develop some language around uh, your uh, postings themselves. Um, consider whether you want to be more expansive than what's required um, for uh, due to a talent acquisition needs. So, for example, why you may not have a requirement um, uh, to provide um, you know, commission information, you might want to um, because simply because, I mean, the, the, at least the feedback that I get is that, you know, some employers are saying, if I only focus on base, it's going to look like I'm not competitive because I actually spend a lot more. Or there's a lot more spend when we think about it from a total comp perspective. I'm not suggesting at all that you need to provide uh, total comp information, but somehow being able to communicate if you're one of those employers that thinks about, you know, the talent acquisition aspect of it, how am I going to get the top talent to apply for my jobs? Um, so it's a, it's a consideration as well as disclaimers. So things like, you know, the posted range applies to the current posting, or it may be changed at some point in the future. You don't want um, there to be uh, the impression that the job is, or the posted range is the job is the range for you know for the future. It's just it applies to that particular posting, or putting some caveats in there that the range, uh, that the actual salary uh, paid to an individual may vary. Um, for uh, key factors such as you know the experience or the uh, that someone brings to the table or the specific skills they have. So something along those lines you're going to want to think about and consider um, as the organization moves through and responds to the to the requirements. So with that we're going to move into oh I guess I have one more slide on the next slide. Um, the other is to consider how you're going to address questions from employees in jurisdictions that don't have pay transparency requirements. You might get questions there. Are you as an organization on a, you know, one off basis, are you going to respond to an employee in a, in a jurisdiction that doesn't have pay requirements? Are you going to respond to their request? for information on their pay scale. That's a consideration. It's beyond the legal. This is more the practical and the business considerations there. Um, you also want to uh, have a strategy for how you're going to respond to your current employees um, when they might have questions about the position, you know, their, their, their uh, relative position within the range and why they're there. Um, those are questions that may be coming up for you. Certainly, you're going to want to train a key personnel and operationalize the process. So how are you going to go about um, operationalizing the requirements? Um, there was a question that came in through the chat that I tried to respond to um, that had to do with, you know, you've got a posting, you have the pay range in the posting, but there's also in some of the states, it requires you to also provide the information at the time of hire um, or at the time of offer. So you could have a process where you're just referring to the posting. You could instead embed the pay range in your offer letter, but those are the types of uh, operationalizing uh, that the organ is that a word um, that the organization needs to needs to do. And the other thing is, you know, you have to think about as an organization. Now you've got to tell managers. There was a day, the time when people would ask what their pay range, and it was kind of nobody had to respond to that, right? We're in a totally different space now, right? And they, as you've heard, there's lots of differences in the states. As an organization, how do you want the issue of pay transparency for your existing workforce to be addressed? 
Um, and certainly, obviously, you're going to want to continue monitoring the laws and the trends nationwide because it is going to be uh, critical to do so going forward. With that, we're going to head into our rapid fire uh, questions. Uh, we're going to try and do these somewhat quickly. These are questions that we got and we've been trying as questions come through the chat while others have been talking. I've been trying to address some of the, the questions there. But these are questions that came through if you go to the next slide from attendees and I'm going to shoot these to some of uh, our team members here to see if we can get as many of your questions answered as we possibly can. So Christy, the first question is going to go to you. Can I have broad national range that encompasses different geo differentials? Yeah, so if the positions in a physical location probably not um, the requirement is that you post the range that you reasonably expect to pay for the position so that range should be what you reasonably expect to pay for that position at that physical location um, if it's for a remote position it could be broader but if you have ge geographic differentials you may want to consider adding a caveat about that okay maria what about um, a, if a salary, why don't you take a second uh, question? What if the salary range for current employees is different than what I expect to pay the successful candidate? So I think that if the, there, there should be again caveats in the posting language for something like this. So there is no requirement in the laws that you have to post what your current employees are making and that your range should be based on what your current employees are making. But for all the reasons that Annette had mentioned before about your, um, your internal uh, concerns from current employees and addressing that, there should be caveats in your posting about um, why the range is what it is. And um, there is also the nuance with Washington with potentially having a different range um, than what your full range may be. Okay, great. Why don't you stick on, uh, go, uh, continue on with the next uh, question. How do I define the salary range for employees paid on a full commission basis? Sure. So full co commissions are considered other compensation under the laws. So for states like New York City, um, there is no requirement to disclose um, other compensation and it wouldn't be encompassed in the salary range that you're posting. That said, I do think it's a good idea to put in that a, a job is based on commission and it's a fully commissioned role um, just to make clear that you are complying with the law and that you are providing compensation information generally. Um, I'll note that for a New York state, um, if that law is passed, it does provide that clarification also that for commissioned roles, um, you should be providing a general statement that the position is commissioned and that complies with the law. Um, another caveat for Washington, um, because Washington just loves to do things a bit differently, um, there is some language in the Washington guidance about commissioned roles um, and that for positions that are compensated by commission rates, there is this, uh, a guidance that says that the employer should include the rate or rate range percentage or otherwise that would be offered to the hired applicant. And the example provided in the Washington guidance is um, that it says for a commission-based salesperson, five to 8% of net sale price per unit. Um, so this is in the guidance for Washington. No other state kind of requires that type of breakdown. And arguably Washington doesn't either because it's listed as an employer should include the rate or rate range. Um, but it is something to note as something that the Washington agency thinks is required. Um, and then just quickly on base plus commission positions, I typically will advise to include the base salary range and including that full dollar amount and then adding that a commission is also available and specifying that. And I, I think that helps for recruitment purposes and to really get the, um, the sense of what is being offered for the position. Again, not required because you're not required to describe other compensation, but um, I think it's a good idea in this case. Okay, great. Um, I'll take the next one. Can I offer salary above or below the posted range? 
Um, I would say yes, you can offer salary certainly above the range. Below, I think, is going to be a little harder. You can certainly do it, but you're probably going to have a dissatisfied uh, candidate um, if you're offering less than the posted uh, range. You know, keep in mind that these are good faith, um, you know, based on your good faith uh, belief in terms of what you might pay. You might end up getting a candidate that for some reason is exceptionally strong. Uh, there might be a legitimate reason why you need to uh, pay more there. You could end up in a, a hard to fill uh, position um, that forces you to go higher than what you expected. There is no requirement to. Um, that you have to pay within that range, but you do have to have a reasonable expectation about what you're moving forward with. So keep that in mind. Um, all right, Charday, you're up. What if an applicant from a from a jurisdiction that requires wage range disclosure in a job posting applies for a position to be performed outside of that jurisdiction? Do I have to repost the job with the salary range? So this is definitely a question that we get a lot, especially with the increase in remote positions. The the importance is going to be focused on where the position is based, not where the applicant is based. So the exception to that is if it's a remote role, then you are going to need to comply with the job posting requirements for the various jurisdictions that have these rules. But otherwise, it is going to be based upon where the role is based, not where the applicant is. And you do not need to repost the job with the salary range. You just want to make sure that if it's remote, you are complying uh, when you make the initial post. Okay, great. Why don't you continue on with our next question? Do I have to change my job postings that are already up 1123? Sure. So our position, unless we receive guidance otherwise, is that this is going to be perspective. So if you have a position that was posted before January 1st, you do not need to go and update those positions with the postings. You just want to make sure any postings made as of January 1st or later are compliant. And then, of course, you know, there are some jurisdictions that are already in effect, like New York City. So those postings should already be in compliance with the requirements. Okay, great. Maria, we'll take our next question. I only have one employee in the jurisdiction. Do I have to disclose pay? So this issue is super important for remote roles. Um, for California, uh, for Colorado, New York City, um, Washington too, it specifies that if you have one employee in the jurisdiction and there's another threshold for a total number of employees, but as long as you have one employee there, then you need to comply with the laws in those states. So for remote positions where you might have one employee in New York City um, and you're posting for a position that can be performed anywhere, in, including New York City, then you do have to comply with the New York City law. Um, the, the, there is a difference if you are posting for a position outside of New York City, though. So even though you have to comply with the law, if you're posting for a position to be performed in Massachusetts, then you wouldn't have to post the New York City range to comply with the, the law. Um, but generally, for these types of remote positions, it, it's, it's important. And if you have one employee, you have to comply. Okay, go ahead and take us uh, with our next question, uh, Maria. We're gonna try and pick up the pace on these because we still, we're running fast out of time and lots of sure. questions are coming through and have a whole nother section. So let's go quickly. Sure. Um, generally an electronic link is okay. Um, I will note that there is another caveat for Washington where the guidance seems to suggest that you can, you should generally describe the benefits and other compensation in the actual posting and then can link to additional information in a hyperlink, but the general information should be in the actual posting. Okay, great, Maria. Um, the next question we already covered earlier on is the pay range only required on postings. Uh, Christy gave us a summary of that. Postings is broader than just a, a you know, there's a broader uh, connotation to, to the definition of posting. But Sharday, let me ask you, do we need to post or provide pay skills to all employees? This is going to be dependent on jurisdiction. So Rhode Island is going to have a requirement to provide a pay scale to employee upon higher moving to a new position or upon request. Uh, California has a requirement that you provide it to employees upon request. And then Connecticut also has a requirement that you're going to provide upon request. 
Okay, enforcement so far that that just came up on a chat as well as uh, we got a pre question. Christy, can you talk about enforcement so far on these uh, laws? Yeah, so so most of the jurisdictions at this point have been focusing on helping companies come into compliance. Um, but we do know that Colorado has sent out cease and desist letters to non compliant companies. And to our knowledge, only two companies have been issued penalties out in um, Colorado, but that's because they just simply ignored those cease and desist letters. Um, in New York City, the commission has actually requested increased budget to add staff for enforcement purposes. Um, so we do expect enforcement there, but the commission has also said that at least initially their goal is gonna be to help companies get into compliance and, and not issue penal uh, penalties right away. Okay, and then I'll just uh, quickly take the last one here. Are there states that might implement pay transparency in 23? Um, it's gonna be in the DAC. We identified those early on. Um, so yes, we're closely watching it. We do think that this is a trend. So it's really important to stay focused on that. We did get a question on the regs for California. I know everybody's been waiting on those. I do um, expect those. Uh, Chardé actually got an update that there were uh, some, some uh, regs that were coming out or guidance that was coming out uh, in the first week of January. Um, I hope that that's only for the uh, pay reporting um, and hopefully before the end of the year, uh, you'll be receiving something from the state in terms of regulations on the pay transparency requirements, but those might be tied together. And with that, we're gonna flip to our next section. Sade, take us there. And if you'll start us off with our CLE, um, a number, and then we'll touch quickly on pay transpa uh, excuse me, pay reporting. Yeah, so I'll first read the CLE code. It is SS as in Cypherth Shaw, 7699. SS as in Cypherth Shaw, 7699. So we'll quickly go over some of these pay data reporting requirements for California. On the next slide, we kind of laid out the key changes that we've seen for pay data reporting under SB 1162. The deadline has been pushed back to provide the report. The scope has increased essentially because now there's no requirement that you be an employer who has to file an EEO-1 report. It just applies to employers with 100 or more employees, at least one of which in California. And there's an additional data requirement of including the mean and median hourly rate information in the reports that's new from the prior reports on employees. And then we have a new labor contractor report, which has been on everyone's mind right now. So on the next slide, we will cover a key issue with the labor contractor report. The requirement in the statute is that private employers file a report on employees hired through labor contractors, and this is a separate pay data report, but employees defined as an individual on an employer's payroll, and a lot of clients do not employ their labor contractors in that way. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy because the intent is that California receives data and information on all of the labor contractors that are working in the state but in effect, by using the term employee hired through labor contractors, uh, that doesn't necessarily align with the intent. So we're kind of waiting to see how this is cleaned up and what kind of additional guidance is issued on this point. But we do expect this will be cleaned up somehow. We just don't know when um, and what mechanism is going to be used to clean it up. So if you have labor contractors, definitely want to discuss a strategy with your legal counsel to determine um, how you're going to report, if you're going to report, and how this requirement might affect you. Uh, Annette is going to touch on Illinois as well, the other state we have that has a reporting requirement. Okay, if we can flip to the next slide. Really, there, I, I included several slides on here to give you an overview. We did a presentation on this, uh, on Illinois and the reporting requirements already. What I wanna impress upon you at this point is um, if you go to slide 30, uh, that'll give you sort of an overview of the kinds of things that we uh, that will be included. It's a EEO-1 report, the equal pay compliance statement, as well as employee level detail. Um, the, the reason why I wanted to bring this up is if you are an employer that has at least 100 employees in the state of Illinois and you have not provided your contact information, 
um, with the agency, you're going to want to do that sooner rather than later. Um, I'm aware that some the agency tried to contact uh, different uh, companies uh, through they uh, apparently they even purchased uh, contact information or lists. Um, and so some of that information hasn't been routed to the right place. So you really do want to get this information by March of 2024. All Illinois employers will have been required to submit for an equal pay registration certificate. If you have not received a deadline or not, the law is still um, it's sort of on you. They're going to uh, this. The Department of Labor is issuing sort of staggered dates. Um, deadlines for employers, but if you, for some reason, don't get a notification, you're still going to have that compliance requirement by March of 2024. Um, and so we actually just got uh, the regulations uh, have been uh, revised. Um, there's a notice and comment period. So while many employers have already had to submit their pay reports, they have not yet been finalized. Um, the, the proposed rules haven't been finalized, but those should be happening soon. They're coming up for a vote. Uh, very shortly, so expect those to be finalized, but it's really important to get your contact information in with um, the state so that they can reach out to you with the correct deadline. If you have any questions about that, you can contact the Department of Labor um, and just say, hey, has my company been scheduled? I would encourage you to do that if you're just not sure. Um, let us know. We'd be happy to help you um, with that as well. So we are at the top of the hour. We tried to pack in as many responses to questions that came in as well as hopefully addressing as many questions via the chat um, as we could. Thank you so much for participating. We will be sharing uh, the slides and the recordings uh, with you all. Thank you so much for attending.